Hello, everybody. We're here with uh, Dr. Greg Silber, um, a scientist uh, very known in the marine mammal world. Greg has been working for more than 40 years, um, has been in 40 years with marine mammals, has been working for NOAA for 23 years. Uh, and he mainly worked with the endangered large whales uh, during his career. Um, Greg has won several several awards, including a gold gold medal that's shared with the colleagues by the Department of Commerce in developing and implementing the right whale mandatory ship reporting systems. And uh, Greg has also worked in a lot of places in the world and with a lot of uh, different topics, such as bycatch, effects of uh, human activities, for example, uh, the industrial noise, the seismic exploration, um, and has also worked in a very interesting and uh, exotic place, uh, the Arctic, with the narwhals, belugas, and bowhead whales. So, hi Greg, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Um, and so tell us a little bit about your story. How did it start, uh, this fascination and, and work with the marine mammals? Um, I found early on when I was a youngster actually that I was most comfortable and most happy near the ocean. And I liked walking on the beaches and I liked being in boats. And I set a career goal of wanting to be able to study uh, marine animals. And especially, I became interested in intelligent life, um, right. in um, marine life. And that uh, really led me to dolphins and whales. I did a master's degree on humpback whales, um, their social vocalizations, and then uh, went to a PhD where I worked on um, a small harbor porpoise species called the vaquita, which lives only in Mexico. Yeah, so you're actually one of uh, the first uh, scientists that work with the vaquita together with the, um, with Kent Norris. Uh, so how was it back in the was it early eighties? Uh, I think. Yeah. Yes, in the early eighties, I began my PhD work, and uh, Ken Norris was my advisor, uh, my graduate advisor, and he had described the small harbor porpoise species, maybe one and a half meters, 1.4 meters uh, in length. Very small animal and really unknown to the world. And Ken had found a skull on a beach uh, in um, the Gulf of California, Mexico. He knew it was uh, something he had never seen before. And he described it and as a totally new species. He called it Pocina sinus. Uh, and it's found only in the upper Gulf of California, Mexico. Uh, and when I came along much later, he did that in 1958, when I came much later to do my graduate work, he told me, he said, uh, <clears throat> I want you to tell me everything about this species. I want you to go there and I want you to tell me about its ecology and its natural history and why it makes the sounds it makes and why it looks the way it does and what it feeds on. So I set out to do that. Ken was a little bit ahead of his time, I think, because he proposed that we uh, senses the animal acoustically, and right. he said vocalize in very, very high frequency ranges, way outside of human hearing ranges, and he said uh, it's going to be quiet there. There's no fish, there's no other mammals that vocalize in those frequency ranges, so you should be able to detect it. Um, I wasn't too successful at doing a census, um, an acoustic census. We ended up making the first recordings of the animal that had not been described before, uh, very high frequency echolocation clicks. But we um, set out to do what he asked, which was to try to um, describe where this animal occurred and its habitat and, um, and its behavior. And we, we were lucky. I wanted to tell you, Joanna, that <clears throat> we, on the second day of our field work, we, uh, we saw two individuals, and um, not long after we saw them, they got sort of run over by about 200 common dolphins. Wow. Uh, dolphins. <laughs> so the vaquita were going along here, and, and a whole group of uh, bottlenose dolphins, I mean, sorry, common dolphins sort of overran them, so we lost them. <laughs> but then we 
for then we looked for six more weeks. We looked at almost every day for six weeks before we saw another one. Oh, okay. And then we were fortunate enough to find uh, quite a few in one particular location. And every time we went back to that area, we found them there. So we began to realize that their habitat was very narrowly defined and it's a very small population, a very small animal in body size. But um, we ended up uh, seeing quite a few there and, and getting some behavioral observations and the underwater recordings. Um, and it, it was a it was a wonderful time because it was a fairly remote field area, uh, study area, and uh, we were outside most of the time and it was quite rewarding. <laughs> yeah. And did you guys did, um, uh, so for your PhD, you, you, you used um, acoustics, uh, um, acoustic senses, you were saying, did you, did you do visual as well? Yes, so the, the dissertation was, uh, again, as Dr. Norris had asked, to try to describe everything we could about that animal. So mostly we talked about its habitat. Uh, the uh, water depth, the distance from shore, we tried to characterize this area where we found them consistently. Um, water temperature and turbidity. One of Dr. Norris's theories at the time was that the animal um, really uses turbidity really to hide from predators and to seek its prey, uh, feeding on the bottom or in the water column. So, and then uh, we did record um, some of its vocalizations. It's very high frequency echolocation yes. clicks. That was part of the dissertation. And we also were fortunate enough on a handful of occasions to actually observe its behavior for, um, for extended periods. Um, and so, the dissertation was partly about the acoustics, partly about the behavior, mostly about its ecology, what it was feeding on, and trying to describe its habitat. Yeah. So yeah, for for the people that know don't know, studying uh, porpoises, it's always quite challenging. Uh, it is. It can be very challenging. The other thing that became sort of clear was. Um, uh, habitat partitioning or different animals are using different portions of that whole study area and they didn't cross too much. So we had a lot of bottlenose dolphins and fin whales and mostly the uh, vaquita did not really interact in the same habitats where um, bottlenose dolphins were. Yeah, they, this animal is often called shy and I'm not sure that's a really good characteristic, uh, good description of it because um, it's just hard to see. It's very, very difficult to see. I, um, but we were, as I said, we were fortunate on a number of occasions. I remember um, we were lucky because on some days it was just very, very calm, flat calm. It was calm than a lake. Most days it was fairly windy. And on those days we um, encountered uh, on two different days, two different mothers and calves. And we were able to track them. So to get your to your question about the visual, we were able to track them um, visually for over an hour and a half oh, each wow. day. So we were able to characterize how often, uh, how long their dives were and how much time they spent at the surface. And I think we were aided too because the calves were pretty young. So the mother and the calf had to come to the surface fairly frequently. So you got a little bit of idea of the dive pattern. Uh, yes. During yes. the week with the calves. Yes, that's, that's, that's really yeah. exciting <laughs> for one hour and a half. I wish I could have done that with Maria Harbor Porpoise, but no. <laughs> right, as 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 you say, Joanna, Harbor Porpoises generally, yeah. they're very difficult because, as you know, you see them and they're small and they're um, they're not at the surface for very long and they move in sort of erratic patterns. So. Right. Some of the other species, you know, you can sort of predict where they're going to be going or they're in very large schools. And it's easier to track, but with porpoise, harbor porpoises, it's often difficult because they're in very small schools. And I think maybe because they're feeding, they, they come up here and then the next time you see them, they're over there. And next time you see them, they're 200 meters that way. So um, we, in that case, we were really aided by the very, very calm waters. Excellent. Okay, and so after the porpoises, you kind of like start working more with the endangered large whales. So what was the species that you worked the most? 
during so the after I finished my dissertation, I then uh, went to work uh, at the Marine Mammal Commission for five years in which we in which I worked on a lot of things that was uh, Arctic species, polar bears and um, bowhead whales, but also oil and gas development issues in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere. Uh, I was there for five years before I went to uh, NOAA Fisheries and there when I almost as soon as I walked in the door there, it was became very clear that one of the main issues was uh, the endangered North Atlantic right whale. And so um, that that species, in addition to humpback whales and fin whales, all large whale species that were listed under our Endangered Species Act um, were my responsibility. Uh, but really most, much of my time was spent on the North Atlantic right whale. At the time, there were about Two to three hundred individuals believed to be uh, alive, and they were and still are to this day heavily impacted by entanglement in commercial fishing gear, and also um, they get run over by ships by accident. Um, this species occurs along the east coast of the United States and into Canada, and there's obviously a lot of ship traffic there, and also a lot of fishing. So. Um, in addition to writing recovery plans and status reviews for humpback whales and uh, recovery plans for blue whales and fin whales, um, a lot of my time was spent on North Atlantic right whales. Right. And um, do you think, uh, uh, or can you tell us, in your opinion, what are the species that suffer the most with the ship striking in, in your study area? Yeah, so if you look globally, I like to say that, don't like to say, but it's, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, anywhere that large whale species occur and ships occur, there's a possibility for ship strikes. Uh, I just saw a paper recently that said that uh, not only large whales, but mediums, mid-sized whales, resos dolphins, killer whales, pilot whales, also uh, can be struck by ships. It's completely accidental. Nobody wants to hit one of these animals, but it's a fairly common occurrence, especially around port entrances, large port entrances. So, um, and it could be that some species are a little more vulnerable than others. Right whales, for example, swim very slowly. They spend a lot of time at the surface, but also records indicate that fin whales are, are fairly commonly struck. Um, and I, I think that a lot of it has to do with just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think oftentimes whales are feeding or nursing or engaged in other types of activities and are just uh, oblivious to an approaching ship. And they can get hit by small vessels or large, very large ships. Um, some, oftentimes people ask why if they, if ships are making a lot of noise, why don't the whales just simply move out of the way? And I think part of it is, again, they're engaged in their vital behavior. Um, but also, I think the world's oceans are filled with a lot of ship noise. And so an animal may not necessarily appreciate that a ship is, is approaching. Um, and even in fairly close quarters, they may not know at what point they should respond. Uh, whether it's meters or hundreds of meters. Mm -hmm. um, and given how many ships there are out there and some large whale species are beginning to recover, recover I think, you know, the, the likelihood of them uh, coming in contact with each other is going to be more and more common. Right, right, right. So um, do you think that the, uh, the speed of the vessels obviously should have influence on the, on the strike? Um, do, do, is there any sort of speed that you, that, uh, uh, you recommend in terms of um, reducing these possible impacts? Right, that's a good question. I sent you some slides. I don't know. Yeah, if I, will, I will share them later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, not, again, not long after I came to NOAA and the issue of ship strikes or um, whales, right, North Atlantic right whales being run over by ships became um, very obvious to me and, and others as well that it was a major threat to the recovery of this population. You have maybe 300 individuals and an average of, say, two a year are being run over, uh, and especially if they're 
reproductively active females or mature females, then for every one that you kill, you lose her reproductive life of uh, calving, especially if she happens to produce female um, offspring, you lose a, many generations of um, uh, productivity there. Yeah. So um, I became aware of a paper in which someone said that it looks as if vessel speed is a critical factor in um, these ship strikes. And I remember thinking uh, there's no way that the solution is that simple or that there's a silver bullet, or that we can reduce um, the numbers of these strikes based only on one factor, which is ship speed. But as we began to look at it, and um, I, along with colleagues, looked at all the data we could find on ship strikes in which we knew what the fate of the animal was. That was, that was it either died or was seriously injured. And there was a relationship between the speed of the vessel and um, fatality of the whale. So um, not too long after that, we began to um, explore the idea of, slow, of making ships go certain speeds along the east coast of the United States to reduce um, the probability of those strikes. And there's um, a, a curve, there's a relationship between uh, ship speed and, um, and the fatality of the of the whale, and it's a it's a pretty direct relationship between the faster the ship is, the more likelihood of that animal dying. And and curve kind of has a little bit of an inflection around ten or twelve or fourteen knots of speed for these ships. So we began, and um, this is a a part of my career that I'm proud of. But we began the idea of limiting ships uh, off of Boston and New York and Charleston and uh, Savannah, Georgia. Um, and we were successful in implementing areas where 20 nautical miles from the coast, ships had to go 10 knots or less. And um, I, I think there are other, there are other factors. I, you know, again, the behavior of the animal and maybe the size of the ship, but the speed um, seemed to be quite critical. And um, after implementing those measures, we found it to be um, quite successful. And we, we were able to quantify, um, myself and, and others, lots of others, um, began to quantify an actual reduction in ship strikes. I, need, I do need to point out that the best way to avoid a ship strike is to remove uh, the animals from the ships or the ships from the animals. So in areas where you know these whales are occurring and you're able to move the ships or, or, or concentrate them in certain uh, routes that probably it, uh, will, it will definitely reduce uh, the probability of a strike. But uh, we found that um, reducing the speed as well was a key factor. Right. So you think reducing speed, it might be the, the, the easiest and uh, not, not easiest, but a, a very good measure to implement in other places in the world, do you think it will work better or will be easier to implement than, for example, the, the theory of the, some people, some people talk about the, the corridors, um, and uh, um, do you think we should go this way with the speed or, um, What's your thoughts about the corridors and all that? Yes, yeah, so I've given this a lot of thought over <laughs> 20 or so years. Um, the best, um, is because I like to just try to discourage people a little bit from only talking about lookouts, for example, posting right. on the bow of a boat, because um, oftentimes it's foggy or it's windy or the sea state is so high that it's difficult for observers to reliably see whales. And Again, no ship captain wants to hit a whale. So they say, well, we'll avoid it. Uh, but you have to detect it, and then you have to take steps to avoid it. So you might avoid one animal, but go into a group of two or three others. So um, the best way to reduce ship strikes is if you can move ships 
their their transits and their cord their routes into areas where you know that whales are going to be concentrated. That is the best because you're removing the two entities. You're separating the two entities. But if that's not always possible, let's say it's a large port and you don't necessarily want to slow or diminish commerce into a particular port or the transport of people or goods, then uh, one of the only tools in the toolbox is uh, ship speed. And as you say, it's not easy to implement um, um, politically or legally, but I do think it works. I do think it really works. And based largely on the work that we did, those uh, speeds um, down to 10 knots or 12 knots uh, are being used a lot of places in the world now, um, including in the Mediterranean and people are considering them um, off of Greece and um, and a lot of other places as well. So I, it's, I, as you point out, it's not easy to implement, but I do think it works uh, as sort of a last resort. And if the goal is to reduce, save these animals and reduce the number of ship strikes, then I think it's something that should always be considered. Right. Excellent. Okay, and now tell us a little bit about, because I, I love the Arctic, so I always like to hear about the Arctic, and especially because I've never been there. Um, tell us a little bit about how, how's the challenge of working in the Arctic, and obviously you worked with the, probably the three main species or most famous species in the Arctic, the narwhals, the belugas, and, the, and obviously the bowhead whales, which are uh, incredible creatures. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> I started also in 1980, um, and for 10 years or 10 falls, um, summers and falls, uh, autumns, um, went to mostly the northern slope of a uh, north slope of Alaska and also the northern part of Canada. The reason was that at that time oil and gas exploration was really heating up. So um, oil companies were searching for oil, um, very rich reserves um, in the Beaufort Sea. Um, so we were hired and um, I was a subcontractor, it wasn't my project, but mostly to do air, aerial surveys, aircraft surveys for bowhead whales. Um, the concern was that seismic exploration and the ships um, and the noises were disturbing bowhead whales um, and diminishing their accessibility to um, cultural hunting um, by Inuit Eskimos. So um, the goal was to figure out uh, how much uh, noise the the, the whales could handle and how much they might deflect from certain migration routes. So uh, most of that work was from aircraft and um, a team of scientists, I was merely one on a large team, um, did work on uh, respiration patterns and swimming patterns and orientations and, and also just survey work to count uh, how many whales were in a particular region. We did a little bit of work from the ice, but that was mostly from aircraft. One summer um, on a slightly related project in the Eastern Canadian Arctic. Uh, but but in, those, in those aircraft surveys, you see a lot of beluga whales and you see a lot of bowhead whales. And sometimes you see polar bears on the ice and you see ring seals and bearded seals. So the thing that struck me about that area is it's really productive. There are a lot of marine mammals there, a lot of seabirds. Uh, but only one summer I spent uh, further east in the Eastern Canadian Arctic. But there, at that time, we lived on the ice for um, about three, about four weeks. Um, and the whole idea was to record sounds of narwhals and beluga whales under the ice. Um, and that was also in relation to industrial activity. Um, ships, icebreakers were um, removing uh, ores and minerals from the high Arctic. And the concern again was um, about the behavioral changes in those animals. But um, I got to tell you, narwhals are crazy animals. And they, <laughs> uh, Ken Morris used to, he was referring to sperm whales, but he said they were, the body was built by committee. That is, nobody could decide what it should look like, and everybody added pieces to it. <laughs> and the narwhal is a little bit like that. It's sort of like 
what were you thinking when you involved, evolved this tusk? But um, they are really amazing animals, and I think that they dive really, really deep, and I think they, um, you know, they're echolocating almost constantly. Um, and the beluga whales were really numerous, and they uh, were just chattering day and night. And my previous experience was with humpback whales, and mm -hmm. you sort of listen, and when you hear something interesting, you might hit your recording device, and you might record for 20 or 30 minutes. And when I went to the Arctic, I said, well, do you want me to turn on the recorder when I hear something? And I was told 24-7, hours a day under the ice it's okay. just constant noise and you hear you can hear ice moving you know rumbling and you can hear seals vocalizing and you can hear narwhals clicking and so it was quite um quite interesting but also they're highly productive people you know biologically productive people think it's cold but the animals are adapted there's a photoplankton blooms and all the birds and the fish and the whales respond to that. So um, it's an interesting place. Um, we saw a lot of polar bears out on the ice. Right. So when you were doing the, the those studies, the acoustic studies, you were in the ice or were you in the little vessel uh, always in the ice? No, and, and Joanne, I've only done this once, but it was, uh, and it was new to me, but it was remarkable at the same time. We were living on the ice, so we were taken there uh, by snowmobiles, and um, it was, the ice was anywhere from 12 to um, 15 feet thick, and the water below us was, I don't know, um, two or 3,000 feet deep, but we were living on the ice, and I was to drill a hole into the ice and drop the hydrophone through it. Um, but there are things called leads where you have um, uh, small areas uh, like a river or a stream of open water in a vast sea of ice, and that's where all the animals would come up to breathe. So uh, you could sit right on the edge of the ice and see <clears throat> narwhals and belugas um, in quite high numbers um, swimming through those areas. So, uh, but we were on the ice and um, uh, living in tents. Was it was it tough to live in the ice? Were you guys wearing all those survival suits and <laughs> all that? We were we were expedited by experts who knew the ice really well. I never I never got cold once. I never felt afraid once. Um, I was just mostly blown away by the biology of it. Uh, again, seabirds everywhere and uh, seals everywhere. So uh, it was. It was a new habitat for me. I had never seen anything like that. Um, but um, no, it, and it was the summertime or fall, so time, so it wasn't all that cold. Right, right. Uh, and you were sleeping on the tents. Yeah, sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how many hours a day would you would you work um, there? Well, yeah, they they the people I was working for wanted recordings 24 hours a day. So I would try to um, sample maybe 15 or 20 minutes every two hours. And I tried to do that um, 24 hours a day. Right. So the team would have different shifts and rotating between, between shifts. Um, I was mostly the one responsible for the recording. <laughs> okay. okay. much on me. But um, there was a large team of people there who were also doing um, behavior. Um, visual observations and cleaning the camp and doing that. But I was just a very small part of a much larger project. And, um, but it was interesting. I spent a much more, a lot more time um, on, on the Alaska side and the Western Canadian side. And that was, um, again, trying to figure out, um, and, and again, I was a very small part of a large project, but trying to figure out, um, and work that's still ongoing now, um, to this day, um, trying to figure out the impact of industrial activity on those bowhead whales. Right. Yeah, amazing. So, uh, Greg, if you don't mind, I'll just ask, if, um, let's change a little bit to more personal questions, if you, if that's okay with you. And uh, do you want to tell us the, like a, a very exciting moment that you had, like one of the most exciting moments that you had on the field, either you know. Um, uh, super good or super sad, but that creates a lot of emotion in you. 
Yeah, I, I often, this was a long time ago, but I often reflect back. I want to tell you a story about the vaquita. Right. This is the Gulf of California Harbor Porpoise. And <clears throat> I described to you what we were trying to do and a little bit about the field work. Um, but it was, a, it was definitely a challenge to try to um, record the underwater vocalizations of these animals because they are, um, again, very, very high frequency, way outside frequency ranges that humans hear. And so we had specialized equipment for that. Um, but it, it was so long ago that it was a little bit archaic by today's standards. So we had um, a system where I couldn't analyze my data until I got out of the field. So um, we, uh, so I, I was analyzing um, hours and hours and hours of recordings in which I didn't have um, Bakita recordings. Uh, but one day, I'll remember it very clearly, I was sitting in my den, in my lab, and at home, and listening to these tapes, and uh, heard a sonar click, and a number of clicks. There, uh, I didn't know what it was at first. I thought I had heard sonars from submarines and fish finders, and um, by listening uh, in a lot of different places. And so I looked back at my field notes, and I thought maybe a submarine or a fishing vessel was nearby. Uh, way too shallow there. Uh, these vaquita are only found in about 10 meters of water, or a little more. Um, and so I looked back at my field notes, and I was trying to figure out if any fishing vessels were around there. And I looked uh, at my notes, and at the timing, at that time, a vaquita mother and calf had approached our boat and had come toward us and dove directly under it and came up on the other side. And so I went back and looked at the recordings and I realized that they had probably interrogated, had probably scanned our hydrophone. And so I was sitting by myself listening to these tapes and I realized I may have been the first human to actually hear uh, their their vocal their vocalizations their echolocation plate. so i did got up and did some fist pumps around the room and i went back and checked and checked and realized that maybe i was the first person to actually hear um their underwater uh, wow vocals. that's that's a very good story <laughs> very good story especially with the species that nowadays um it's so uh, talked about uh, in regards to all the conservation measures that are in effect for the recover of the vaquita. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, you make a good point. And, you know, we're talking a lot about me and that, that's fine, but a lot of good people are trying to figure out um, in the case of that and are doing a lot of really good conservation work. And in the case of that animal, the vaquita, People are very concerned because there's a high bycatch right now. The population is very small. But I did want to point out one other thing. Um, not long ago, we convened a workshop about climate change. And we tried to assess out, way out into the future, uh, right. 10, 50 or 100 years, what it might look like. And we pretty much, for, for, most, for strictly marine mammal species, and we sort of concluded that uh, it may not be have a really great impact for a lot of animals. Uh, perhaps large whales can go elsewhere to find their, their prey further north or go elsewhere where conditions change, the upwelling changes or the productivity differs. But it suddenly occurred to me while listening to these experts that um, the ice in the Arctic is receding and it's changing very, very quickly. So, animals that are dependent on the ice, seals and polar bears, will be strongly affected. Right. And another type or the class of species that will be affected are ones that are limited in their range. And so the vaquita is one that I think uh, might be really impacted by climate change. And it's also, it exists in a cul-de-sac. It exists in a trapped area. It can, cannot go further north. Mm -hmm. It's already very warm, and as you know, most harbor porpoise species are fairly cold water species. So it could be that the vaquita is highly impacted by climate change. The waters are warming and sea levels are changing, um, but that is a species that already sort of on the brink, very small population size, impacted by human activities, 
uh, and may be further impacted by climate change. Right, for sure. And uh, what about uh, a frustrating moment? I mean, I'm sure you've had a lot of frustrating moments because as a, you know, in the field, we all get a little bit frustrated sometimes. And you mentioned back in the, in the 80s when you were doing your field uh, work with the vaquita, you spent, was it six weeks without seeing uh, an animal? So do you have any first, or because you work a lot with acoustics, you know, acoustic material tend to, um, not work when we need it the most. <laughs> so, <laughs> any frustrating uh, moments that you would yeah, like to? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I, I'm going to go back to the study of the vaquita and uh, one particular time where, um, and it, it was frustrating but more scary. I thought we were going to lose our lives. Where um, we, what, what we would do is we had a boat just large enough where we could stay. Uh, overnight, several nights. So we'd take enough fuel and enough uh, food and we'd prepare it on the deck. This was a 25 foot boat. Uh, we'd sleep on the deck, but I made a mistake of staying out a little bit too long. So we had stayed uh, three, three and a half days, three nights and four days. Uh, and I waited too long because the weather came up and we didn't have good weather prediction models there. Uh, we were just out of range of um, any radio or anything and the wind came very high and the and uh, we were trying to make our way back home and the swells got bigger and bigger uh, it was a poor decision on my part we should have turned around um, but the the waves were well over our head they were probably larger than the boat itself and so we were um, sort of motoring up the front of these swells and down the other side and Everybody on my, um, all of my crew, was, I think were very, very concerned. So I would say that was one of the more frustrating situations where um, it was not a good call on my part and I put us in not a good situation. Uh, and um, at least one of my crew members said, I thought we were gonna lose our lives for sure. Um, we didn't because I'm still here to talk about it, but um, that was very frustrating and also kind of scary. Yeah. But that in field work, right? Yeah. I mean, you no, exactly. And I, I think we, I think we, we sometimes, uh, obviously, uh, you have 40 years of experience, so uh, I, I can't really compare our experience, but to the little bit I've experienced is sometimes we, we tend to push it a little bit to the limit sometimes because you know, uh, the budget is, is, is limited. We are already out there. So we, let's get a little bit more data. Let's, I need another half an hour of data. I want to take a few more pictures of the other side because I'm not sure if I got it, you know. And, uh, and I think sometimes we push it a little bit and certainly we need to uh, not get um, Super excited and be 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 conscious of all the the risks that um, we take and that uh, sometimes you know it happens accidents happen so yeah I, I remember <clears throat> other people saying look um, if the weather comes up this is thinking now about working in Hawaii on humpback whales you might as well save yourself for another day your knee you know your knees your your feet won't be tired your knees won't, your equipment won't be getting beat up but Joanna, I've seen your field situation and it is, you guys are a long ways from shore and you're sometimes all by yourselves out there and uh, it's a much bigger body of water than I've worked in and I can see how the wind might come up at times, but, and you guys are gallant. You guys are, <laughs> you, know, you try you try to get every data point you can because like you say, you don't know if the wind, you know, if the weather's not going to allow you to come back out another time. And I know exactly what you're talking about. One more data point or one more photograph. Um, but everybody who does that takes some risks. And if you're not careful, um, you might end up paying for it. But you guys, but your, your study uh, area is pretty challenging. I think. It is. And it's quite interesting when we go a little bit further offshore. Uh, 
yeah, obviously because we are, we're, um, we always take extra fuel and all those things, but sometimes we know that the fuel is, you know, almost running out, but there's this amazing behaviors happening and the animals are moving and we want to keep following them because it's a new sort of a unique opportunity or a very exciting moment. And uh, it's always very frustrating when we hear the, our skipper saying, well, <laughs> we need to go back, <laughs> otherwise we're not going to have gas to go back to shore. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I was, it was, I, I mean, when we, uh, for, for, for the people that don't know, we had the pleasure to have you here with us in, in, in Portugal and um, working with us for, for a period of time. And it, it, it was obviously uh, an enormous pleasure and uh but yeah you got you got some experience <laughs> you got the chance to to see how we how we do it as well most of most of my field work has not been quite that far from shore so you i think you guys are brave to do what you do and um <clears throat> i think we talked about this a little bit when i was there one thing that's exciting about work is um every time you go out there you never know what you're going to see especially with marine mammals you you're um you'll you'll almost always be surprised or amazed by seeing something and often you know very often there aren't two days that are the same and and when you go out um i i don't it's maybe i don't know if it's characteristic only of marine mammals it's probably true of any study but when you go out there they're going to reveal something to you about their lives and their natural history that you that perhaps you or nobody else has ever seen before and I, you know it's, uh, I saw it, and you got you know, and you guys study situation, and um, it's a it's a great one there. But I thought you were going to say, well, when the skipper says, well, it really is dark, we can no longer see anything. <laughs> but also, again, you have a fairly large body of water, so the wind can come up. But that's true anywhere. Yeah. And yes, for sure. I think you guys are super careful, but you're also finding some interesting things. Yeah. As well. <laughs> yeah. No, we always need to be. Everybody needs to be careful because, as you said, the weather sometimes change completely in a fraction of minutes that we were not expecting, and suddenly we might see ourselves in a complicated situation. And um, yeah, and of course, it's not just us researchers on board, but there's always sometimes students or volunteers. So of course, we need to be very cautious and always have uh, that in mind. But wouldn't you say that it's true every time you step on the boat, you know, <clears throat> you don't know what you're going to see, and you you can almost expect to be surprised and and nature is going to reveal something to you and and you never know if you're going to see something nobody has ever seen before. I know, that's the problem, right? <laughs> and that's what it makes it so exciting for for yeah. uh, for field biologists, I think. Okay, and Greg, keeps, maybe yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. And that keeps us going back out every day, that's right? True. That's true. That's true. And it sort of refuels the battery for yeah. um, things that we might not be so happy to 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 do later on. Um, so maybe a final question: um, Who? I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm inspired by a lot of scientists, as yourself. You're one of. Uh, one of the people that really inspired me. Um, do you want to share the people that inspired you in the past, they still do in the present, and why? Yeah. So the, the people that I was most inspired by, uh, among them was Ken Norris, I, uh, my graduate advisor. He's now passed, but he, um, he really revolutionized our field and um, made it made us all ask questions of nature that and framed them in a way that I think a lot of us hadn't done in the past. There's a guy named Roger Payne who I also worked for um, in Hawaii and um, Roger's still with us fortunately and he's still asking, he's still challenging all of us. Um, now he's working on um, on pollutants in the ocean and again he was one of these people that said look this is these animals are unique, and um, we really need to explore, you know, who they are a lot more thoroughly. Um, someone who retired not long ago, Chris Clark, is someone who 
acoustically, again, opened our eyes and our ears about a lot of things underwater. And he changed our field a lot too, because he said, look, we can count these animals acoustically as well as visually and um, push not only our science, but the industry, the industrial industry and others, I think a lot further along. I would say those three people are, are among the top. Yeah. Um, for, for sure big names in the marine mammal science that's for sure yeah i f if i could go back in time i would really like to meet ken norris <laughs> yeah. Yeah. especially because he was an advisor for so many of my personal idols you know idols and and uh yeah i kind of like would really like you have do you have time for one story about ken norris yes please of course <laughs> The first time I met him was in um, Baja, California, and he was looking at gray whales, and I was very young uh, and green, and I didn't know anything about marine mammals, but we were working on a sailing ship, and he was the principal investigator, and I watched him come to the side of the vessel, and he was leaning over the gunnels, and there were some uh, seabirds. I don't remember what they were, but there were maybe uh, 15 or 20 of them and they were holding station against a tide that was coming in and, and, and swimming in a small school, paddling at the surface. And um, <clears throat> Ken looked at him for a while, maybe 10 minutes, and he ran down below decks and I didn't see him, but I knew he came out later with a small manuscript and he used to type like this on a typewriter with two fingers. And I envisioned him going furiously like this. <laughs> And he came back up and he had written about a page and a half and he said, I think I figured out schooling. Schooling in fish, schooling in dolphins, schooling in, in this case, birds. And he said, I think it's, I think he wrote this up later. He said, I think it's this sort of neuronal thing, just as a, uh, uh, an axon would pass a signal down from between cells. He said, I think these animals are so tightly arranged that if one responds on this side, they all respond in the same way. And he said, I think that's how schooling fish are. Instead of a, an organism, it's multi-organisms and they all respond together. Uh, and I'm like, I said, you just came up with that while you're standing here. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I think I figured out how schooling and, and fishes and dolphins were. <laughs> well, I mean, he was on a different level, I think, than a lot of the other of, of us, but he couldn't he would look at nature and he would say, I have a theory about what's going on there. It's right. very interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, but um, yeah, I mean, you are an excellent ex inspiration as well. <laughs> so, and I, I'm very happy and proud to, to, to have the chance to, to, to meet you, to work with you, to have you present, to, to, to get your input on our project and uh, help. Uh, so certainly uh, a, a good friend <laughs> and um, yeah that's it I just want to say thank you I don't know if there's anything else you want to share with well, I'm, impressed. I'm impressed by you guys and the work that you do too and I think uh, I just encourage you to keep it up because again you're uh, you know finding things that people didn't know about about your study animals there. so I encourage you to keep that up it's been thank a pleasure you. Thank you, Greg. Okay, bye-bye.